you're a cave diver. And after navigating the depths of spinal snap caverns, you come across a clearing with almost enough room to stand up, the first in a while. But then you hear a skittering from the wall behind you. You thought you were alone down here, and you took careful care not to notify any park authorities of your spelunking trip. But something found you regardless. You turn around to see a spindly insectoid creature that's even more at home in these murky tunnels than you are. It's completely harmless, but it looks kind of creepy. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we are talking about the class Diplura, also known as the Two-Pronged Bristletails. This is the final segment of a three-part series covering the Entignatha, three groups that were once considered insects but have since been split off into their separate clades. These three groups and the insects form the six-legged subphylum Hexapoda. And for more information on their evolutionary relationships to one another, I encourage you to watch the Protura video linked above. The Diplora is a pretty overlooked group, both by the casual bug lover and by academia, but they are far from insignificant. It's actually well supported that Diplurans are the sister group to the Insecta, being their closest living relatives. Within this group, you can find a thousand or so species spanning a worldwide distribution, excluding, like, the polar regions. And like the other Antignathans, they also like things moist, so they're lacking in many desert habitats. So if you have a hankering to find some Diplurans, you shouldn't have to go too far. But that doesn't mean that you won't have any trouble. Diplurans are found either underground or pretty close to it. You can find them skittering under rocks and logs, burrowing into the soil, hanging out under the leaf litter, or hiding away in cave systems. Actually, around one-seventh of described Diplurans are these cave-dwelling troglobites. And that's a very high percentage, by the way, like one of the highest for a class-level organism. These guys love their caves. And if that didn't make them hard enough to track down, they're also pretty tiny. Most Diplurans are going to be less than a centimeter in length, but there are some four to five centimeter giants out there. But big or small, there are some key traits you can use to identify the Diplurans. Overall, Diplurans are elongate and flattened allowing them to squeeze under rocks and stones and worm their way through the soil. Because they live in such dark environments, the Diplura are actually eyeless, relying instead on long maniliform antennae and their cerci to feel their way around their environment. But they do seem to be able to detect light through light-sensing organs under their integument. This subterranean lifestyle also led them to lose most of their pigmentation, appearing either white or pale yellow. Now, since they are hexapods, all Diplurans are going to have six legs, which rules out a lot of potential confusion. But let's go over some of the ways they differ from the other hexapods, since those are a lot of the ones you're likely to mix up. Well, unlike their sister group, the Insecta, the Diplurans have internal mouthparts, meaning the mandibles are hidden away in oral folds when at rest, and then exerted when feeding. And also, most adult insects have wings, which the Diplurans lack. At first glance, the Diplurans may look somewhat similar to some of their Entignathan cousins, but they have a pair of appendages on the terminal abdominal segment called cerci. And that's something that the Protura and the Columbula both lack. Also, Proturans don't have antennae, which the Diplurans clearly have. Speaking of Diplurans cerci, there are three broad categories these cerci will fall into. And these are conveniently the three superfamilies comprising the class Diplura. There's the Campidioidea, which have long, flexible cerci. The Japidioidea, which have sclerotized, forcep-like cerci, kind of like the earwigs. And the Projapidioidea, which have shorter, flexible cerci. With the cerci being such a key feature of their anatomy, it's no surprise that this is where their name is derived. Diplos means two, or double and Yura means tail. So Diplura means double-tailed. Checks out. And luckily, the juveniles look quite similar to the adults. Diplurans are ametabolous, meaning they lack metamorphosis. They just go from egg to juvenile to adult, no major aesthetic changes. However, when they first hatch from the egg, they are immobile for a couple days. 
We call this their pre-larval stage. But after those two days or so, they'll have their first molt and be free to move around and rummage for food. Diplurins are omnivorous, and they can be found feeding on plant roots, fungi, decaying organic matter, or small soil invertebrates like mites and springtails. The forcep like cerci on the back of those gepidgeoids can come in handy for grasping prey. And some of the diplurins from the progepidgeoidea can use sticky secretions from their cerci to bind prey and prevent escape. But these weapons can also be turned on one another, as diplurins are not above cannibalism, and the gepidgeoids are believed to skirmish for territory. In terms of defense, these cerci can break off pretty easily, and it's believed that this can be used as a way to fool predators and create openings for escape. But cerci can be pretty important sensory organs. Luckily for them, they can regrow these appendages after a few molts. Like many Apterus hexapods, the diplurins will continue to molt even after reaching maturity. So that gives them plenty of opportunities to regrow a lost appendage. And of course, between hunting soil invertebrates and dodging predator attacks, diplurins still need to find time to mate. Diplurin reproduction isn't as flashy as, say, the mayfly mass emergences or jumping spider mating dances. Overall, they're pretty chill about the whole thing. The male diplurins will go about putting short-stalked spermatophores around the substrate in case a female wanders over and picks one up. That's about it. The female might not even see the male who fathers her eggs. After receiving the spermatophore, the female will hide batches of eggs under stones or leaves to try to give her young the best chance she can. Some gepidgeoids take this a step further and will guard the eggs and hatchlings from potential predators once again putting those cerci to good use. After reaching maturity, diplurins will continue to reproduce for the rest of their days, which if they're lucky, could be two to three years. And we should be rooting for them. Like other entignathans, diplurins provide critical services to our soils, breaking down organic matter, aerating the soil, and acting as a prey item for larger predators. And considering soils make up the basis of nearly every terrestrial habitat, what's good for the soil, is good for us. And don't count out the cave dwelling diplurins. Caves are often very fragile ecosystems and they do not tolerate change very well. So we don't want anything happening to these caverniculous scavengers either. And diplurins are never really pests anyway, so there's no downside to keeping them around. As for how to keep them around, just make sure you've got some organic matter scattered about like leaf litter and woody debris. Anyways, thank you all so much for listening. And if you like the content, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future videos. And if you have any fun facts I missed or any personal experiences with the Deplora, please leave them in the comments below. I always love hearing about them. Peace, y'all.